I will. <laughs> no. All right, we're just going with it. They ruined two takes, folks. They're goofing off. Podcasts are supposed to be fun, Nathan. Nope. Don't believe in it. This one's supposed to be fun. Now that we kicked Brandon to the curb, there will be no more fun. I'm Batman. <laughs> are you Batman? There'll be only fun. Yeah. Brandon was the not fun one. Then it's what we do that defines us. <laughs> You're going to love me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Way to get a load of me. Which Batman movie is You're Going to Love Me from? That's a line from a Batman movie, right? That's from The Dark Knight. Is it from The Dark Knight? It is, yeah. It's from uh, the scene where Joker's messing with everyone at the party. Oh, yeah. And what does the Joker say to set I Batman can't up? I remember. He's like, he, I like pain, or uh, I... You're a feisty one. I like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're going to love me. Yeah. And then Batman jumps out the window with Rachel Dawes in one of the least well-edited sequences of all time as they fall and we cut to like all these if you want an exercise if you want to watch bad action editing watch the random assemblage of shots that one christopher nolan and his editor throws together for batman falling out of the window there and then the joker just kind of disappears from that party and that movie if you take it apart it makes no sense it's a really bad movie but it's really propulsive, and it's got those magnetic performances, and that's all people remember about it. And they're strong enough that it it's still special, but man, that movie makes no sense. It's such a bad movie. No, it doesn't make any sense. It is a bad movie. The action's pretty bad, but none of that mattered, seeing it in IMAX with none of it mattered. And... Well, Heath Ledger was special. Yeah. He was just special. It was just special, and I know it's like the most dumb prosaic thing in the world to say but you can't take it away from him introduce a little anarchy in the way that character was conceived was really fun and great that iteration of the joker tapping into the anarchy and chaos i know comics have been there all the time in all different ways in all kinds of places but tapping into that live action was really fun well, and it felt special. It felt like they they had their finger on the zeitgeist. Like that movie actually oh, felt man. like it was summing, you know, we were what, seven years? I know this sounds grandiose now, but we were seven years from 9-11. 9/11 and that movie and, felt like it really was summing up a certain kind of evil that we were just wrapping our heads around at the time. Well, and then you also had the... The surveillance state. Yeah, and then when were the when were the the... Occupy Wall Street. When was that stuff? I want to put that in like 2004, 2005, but I... I it's a little know. bit after bad, that. I have a bad memory for that um, kind of thing. I'm going to look that up real quick. This is what you tune into a Mrs. Frisbee podcast <laughs> for. <laughs> oh, it absolutely is. Wall. Occupy Wall Street. 2011. 2011. Okay, so that was actually post-Dark Knight. Okay, um, but it was all but, in the water. But it was all in the water. It was all in the mix. A little bit like the Scarecrow's serum. It was in the water. But... Yeah, it was the right movie, right time, right place, right performance. A lot of pixie dust went into that sucker. Yeah, it'll be and interesting. I still, to... I was texting Nathan about this like this past week. I still think about what that third movie would have been. Like I still come back to it. Right. And Nathan was like, when we were talking about it, you're like, they should have just recast it because it would have been a better movie. Mm-hmm. And it what a what a 2020 hindsight impossible risk nobody was ever going to actually do that in the moment type thing but in hindsight that's absolutely what they should have done and the way that you actually pull that off is you recast a joker who replaced the joker and it would make more sense than a joker who killed the joker you you replace darth plagius with palpatine yeah i mean there's any number of ways you could do it but you had to make the Joker central to that third movie. He couldn't just disappear the way he does. Uh, I shower. <laughs> no, you're really not. You're a buffoon who gets gunned down <laughs> ignobly by Catwoman. Like, the, and your, then your movie a, doesn't even give you any dignity. You're just he, some cuck for what's-her-face. You didn't bring back the Raz al, al Ghul plotline from the first movie. Everyone's favorite oh plotline from the first movie. Well, yeah, that plotline really took all that was cool and interesting from the comics and left it behind. Right. (laughs) He's a boring white guy. (laughs) Part of a boring white guy organization. Oh, man. With faceless goons that 
Bruce Wayne trained with and they got to know, but they're faceless goons. It doesn't matter. But the important thing is they have a glowy thing that's going to vaporize everybody with microwaves. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that they didn't. Sense. I'm glad they didn't go into the pure fantasy of Ra's al Ghul's Lazarus pits or whatever that keep him alive for centuries. That would be dumb. Yeah. <laughs> fun, gotta, things <laughs> fun things are dumb. Fun things are dumb. And so they make up all kinds of weird other junk science that makes no sense. Ra's al Ghul is a fun villain. You could do a really cool Ra's al Ghul movie. Oh, no right. one will ever try now. Don't you think James Gunn will? Sure. I mean, maybe. they have to make it not racist one way or another. But well, first of all, James Gunn is going to make a. He's gonna, he gave Andy Muschietti a Batman movie with Batman's biological son. I don't like that storyline at all. But isn't that guy Talia's son? Yeah. Isn't that the yeah, person yeah, that true. Batman It's true. Maybe that'll be a way with. in. Yep. Well, uh, there you go. Well, and all this so that your children can read good literature. Folks, we're here to serve. Yeah. Enough about bats. Let's talk about rats. Hmm. Dude. That's right, folks. We're talking about Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. We're not talking about Mrs. Brisby, the character in that lame Don Bluth movie. We are talking about Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. We're not talking about the secrets of Nim, the title of that lame Don Bluth movie. We are talking about the novel, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Now, Ben and I already talked. Well, by the way, I should say, because I don't think we ever did. I'm Nathan. That's Ben right there. Lou. That's Jake right there. Hey. And <laughs> we were all having so much fun until I tried to introduce us, and then the joy went out of us. <laughs> we're not <laughs> supposed to have fun under Nathan's leadership. That's oh, this, what I've this, learned yep, so far. That's, that's Zero fun. We were trying to have fun. You were like, nope, throw the water on the fun. That's what I'm known for is keeping things on track and leeching the fun out of everything. Speaking of leeches, this book has other animals that grub around in the dirt. <laughs> and the book is <laughs> Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien. Robert C. O'Brien. Not to be confused with Patrick O'Brien, the author of the Master and Commander novels. The, those novels that people always tell you to read if you want to learn about manhood. And if you're me, you're just like, I'm oh, okay. I feel manly enough. I don't have to read those novels, and I don't want to. Thank you very much. I'm sure they're wonderful, but just don't care about naval stuff. Do I like the movie with Russell Crowe? Yeah. I don't know. They, you sure like naval gazing. <laughs> ben? <laughs> Lucky for you wow. that, that murder is <laughs> illegal. <laughs> because otherwise, I think somebody <laughs> might murder somebody. I don't know. Who? Why? I don't get it. No, that was very well done. I'll give it an applause thing. <laughs> that was not applause. <laughs> that was button. pixie dust. Sorry. Where's the applause? There we go. Hey! You launched into it, and I was like, is he going to say I like to wear navel-colored shirts? I, like, I couldn't come up with what the navel <laughs> thing, and then the coup de grace. <laughs> like and a good time was had by all. Now listen, folks. We're talking about Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Walter C. O'Brien. Not to be confused with Patrick O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> we have to start over with. <laughs> Don't care about naval stuff. <laughs> just naval gazing. Just naval gazing. I like Master and Commander just fine. Yes, I wish they'd made more of them. No, they probably won't. Yes, I know that Russell Crowe wants to and has talked about it. Yes, Peter, even recently, yeah. Peter Weir should make more movies. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's a fantastic movie. Yes, it's good to watch with your sons. Yes, I get it. I get it. What does that have to do with Mrs. Frisbee? Nothing. <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> All right. All right. What Batman, do we want? Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe was never cast as Batman. Yep. Who would you cast as Mrs. Frisbee? Cast. When you hurt yourself, you have to wear a cast. <laughs> ah, Mr. Ages wears a cast in this movie. Yeah, uh, it's... That's right. <laughs> the Free Association <laughs> Podcast. It will rob your mind. It's called word association, folks. <laughs> Sometimes it can be a substitution for actual wit. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's. This is not one of those times. <laughs> this is not one of those times. times. <laughs> Time. It goes with Parsley Sage and Rosemary. 
I'm sure I've told this story on the podcast before. One time I went to the store to buy, let's say, thyme and garlic and salt or something like that for a recipe. And I started singing parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme to myself as I went to the store. And I ended up, just without even thinking about it, not grabbing the things that I actually needed, but simply picking out parsley, sage, (laughs) rosemary, and thyme and driving them all the way home. (laughs) True story. That's how my brain works. (laughs) Okay, it was kind of funny. You might be tempted to think that because we are avoiding talking about this book, we hate it. No, no, no. We like this book. That's great. You would know that we like this book if we listen to Sound of Sanity because Ben and I already did a podcast on it. Maybe we'll say all the same things on this one. I don't remember what we said on that one. I don't remember Mm -hmm. anything that we ever say on these podcasts. But we thought it'd be a fun book to do with Jake, and we thought we'd do some of the best of the books that we did there with Jake because Jake should read them. Like a def- last unicorn, I think we definitely want to do that. Anyway, yeah, sure. we're doing Mrs. Frisbee. We're doing the Rats of Nim. It's gonna be good. And the thing that we need the most though is some context. <laughs> now, Ben, you have some context. I do on this work. I do. Oh man. Well, let me tell you, Robert C. O'Brien <laughs> let was. The- <laughs> let me tell you about it. It was the pen name of Robert Leslie Carroll Conley. So this dude was born in 1918 and died in 1973. He did not write very many books. He spent his life writing, most of it for National Geographic, but he started writing books late in life. He wrote three sort of kids or juvenile books and a novel for adults, or maybe two kids' books and two novels for adults, kind of depending on how you want to look at them. He was a musical kid. He was a, like a sickly kid, like a physically and psychologically frail kid, the middle of five children in an Irish Catholic family. So sort of sick like little Timmy, precocious little Timothy in Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. He was sort of a precocious kid who made up his own worlds and stuff. And apparently, so according to his, his wife who wrote a couple of pretty sweet obits about him when he died, he said, she said, here we go. He had a propensity and talent for dreaming. He could and did regularly create splendid imaginary worlds with himself in dazzling heroic roles. While all children do this to some extent, Robert O'Brien's fantasy world was so vivid that he still remembers the place and hour when he, by then a student in high school, made a solemn decision to give it up and to concentrate on living in the real world. All right, that's kind of some C.S. lewis level, maybe dreaming, coming up with your own worlds. And he liked that a lot. I've never heard of an author that went on to any kind of a claim being like, eh, I'm going to give it up. Uh, like you always hear like, <laughs> they came up with these imaginary worlds and they just wanted to live there and everybody always said they were odd. And then one day they made a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. But be, this guy is actually had a pretty boring career, like a boring, normal career without writing fantasy. And he, it's like he just successfully submerged it. And didn't let it pop its head up until way later in his life. And like the last 15 years of his life we're talking, I think. So he he graduated college with an English degree. He worked as a journalist. When World War II conscription came around, he was too weak under 4F classifications. He was disqualified physically and mentally because he'd had this kind of breakdown in college or whatever. So he just stayed a journalist. He worked for Newsweek. The Washington Times Herald, and then he became an editor and writer for National Geographic from 1951 till 1973, which is when he died. And for those last three or four years, he was a senior assistant editor, so he did pretty well there. He was he wrote a lot of stuff, and uh, he's kind of he's interesting because his books have a lot of like natural world type detail. But he came to that relatively late in life, like he was a city guy, city kid, not a country kid. But he, it was like right before he went on staff at National Geographic that they got this, he and his family, he and his wife got this country house. He'd had two out of his four children that he would have, and they got this country home for the weekends, and he's, they, they, he loved it, loved it. And he started a family, like a little family farm there where they had animals, and he just started loving the natural world, and then he was hired by National Geographic. And... You can see that in Mrs. Frisbee. He loves detail. He loves close observation. He's a big fan of all the animals. Apparently, large animals made him nervous. And he, let's see, yeah, they made him nervous, and he made them nervous, is what his wife says. But he liked the small ones. So we have a book about very small animals, Mrs. Frisbee. And that's really all there is to say about this guy. He was Catholic by heritage. I kind of doubt he was Catholic by conviction. It never makes a showing in any of his books. 
I've read three out of four of them, and he liked to write. I mean, he, he wrote, he started writing in, I think it was like around 1960 or 1961, and he didn't publish anything until 1968. So, and then he died in 1973. His last book, Z for Zechariah, which is this, it's good, I guess. It's kind of unsettling. It's not a kid's book exactly. It's a book about a girl who wakes up and the world's been nuked and she's just trying to avoid radiation. And there's this creeper guy she finds who's still alive and he tries to like stalk and rape her and things and she survives. And Sounds very much like a modern YA novel. It really does, except this guy is more classy than that stuff and more interesting. And so the book was interesting. It wasn't like just trash or something. But I don't remember if I really liked it or not. It's been a long time. So he had a small output. I wish he'd live to write more. I wish he'd live to write more Mrs. Frisbee. That would have been just great. But he didn't, and his daughter tried, and we definitely talked about that in the last podcast a little bit. She wrote a couple of sequels, and I may have read both of them, but they are not very memorable, and they kind of betray the, if you want to call it mythology, they they betray the world building that he does, makes it a more like cutesy animal world, where I think the crows are the mail delivery service of the forest, and you're like, what? No, it's more naturalistic in Mrs. Frisbee. So that's Robert C. O'Brien. He loved to write. He was an introvert. He was all those things. He stayed married to one woman and had kids. Seems pretty admirable. And kids would write him letters, apparently. And the kids would write him the kind of letters that were like, I loved your book. Hey, I'm writing a book too. I'm so excited. He would get those kinds of letters. And so I think kids just really plugged into, especially Mrs. Frisbee. Uh, And that's what he's known for. And from what I remember, that's correct, because The Silver Crown, which I read recently, is not, does not quite work. Like, it's interesting, it's fun, it's weird, it's got a lot of cool stuff going for it, but it doesn't quite work, and that's too bad. So, Why does it not quite work? I'd say it doesn't quite work because it doesn't have, it's weirdly like a novel about a little girl facing down this bizarre ancient force of evil but it doesn't he doesn't actually have a vision for evil not much of one he has more a vision for the world as a dangerous and weird place and sometimes people make mistakes and those mistakes lead to them doing evil things but they're just kind of caught in the world and its consequences and that it turns out is not a very compelling (laughs) sort of good versus evil story for the most part. I mean, there's a way to do it. There's a way to make it work. But when you take the failure of, when you take what what feels like, a, I mean, it's boring. It's just boring. It's a boring vision of evil. It doesn't actually describe what evil is or how it works. And when you combine that with a failure to actually finish figuring out what in the world, how, figuring out your own plot in the world building that you've made, that just kind of cripples it, in my opinion. So... It's got all these great ideas. It's got all these cool characters. It's got all these suspenseful scenes. It's got a lot of stuff going for it. It's a successful creation of a little girl who's just a little girl, but is also kind of heroic in her way, and a little boy. And they're the way that they take down some evil people. But then it also feels half finished. Like, you made this up as a bedtime story or something, but you didn't finish figuring out why or how this got here and that got there and the little girl was able to do this then, you just kind of wrote it. Too bad. That's how I feel about that. Without spoiling it all. Oh, sorry. Well, I really I'll thought stop. that was going to be the baggage plane that was going to come. <laughs> <laughs> Let me cut you off like, right there, man. I was going to be like, well, we've <laughs> This context been... has gone on too long. I was actually planning a very smooth transition into baggage <laughs> because we'd already sort of gone there, but... You got that special... Plane made of baggage. Right. Well, here it comes. Here it comes. I knew we go. It's the baggage plane. (laughs) So then, what baggage do you bring to this book? I bring the baggage of having read it many times, Nathan, (laughs) as a child on the dusty trail (laughs) under the stars at night. (laughs) You sit there with your old horse. (laughs) My can of beans. Can of beans. Read Mr. Frisbee. Under the stars. That 
may or may not be well, true. When but... a cowpoke gets a lonesome. <laughs> he pulls out his old copy of Mrs. Frisbee. Rats of Nam. The Rats of Nam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ain't nothing better than a harmonica under the stars. <laughs> Uh, uh, the or, of Mrs. <laughs> okay. I mean, it could be that I read it a lot in elementary <laughs> school, and it was one of my favorite books. That's the other version of what might have happened. Okay. But in any case, I was very familiar with this book. I loved it. I, al- I remember always loving it, finding it completely gripping, different enough from anything else that I read, like even The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. I was trying to think about what made it different this morning, and one thing maybe is that it does pull you into the world of adult concerns. How many kids books have just a middle-aged woman as your main hero? I'm not sure that in even in Lord of the Rings you got Frodo. Frodo feels like a kid in certain ways. And then oh any all the other books that we talked about in our Sound of Sanity run on fantasy books excepting like Last Unicorn or something. Right. They're, all, they're kids books and they have kids as the protagonists and you don't typically go to imagine yourself as a female widower as a kid. Middle-aged female widower. Who's not going to level up into anything. No, and she's not going to level up. She's just going to kind of be who she is, sort of an indomitable little weak mouse against the natural forces and consequences of a world where bad things happen, and it's dangerous, and you could die any time. And that was just a different view of the world than anything else. And it was cool. And it was just very gripping for what it was. And as much as I remember liking Secret of Nim, which we reviewed on Sanity at the Movies and we're both very disappointed, did not live up to our memories, our childhood memories, it, Rats of Nim does not have the same kind of fireworks or fantasy or sword fights or any kind of like weird leveling up that dude, what's his name, tried to add Don to Bluth. the story. Yeah, thanks, Don Bluth. And he didn't really succeed in what he was doing. Mrs. Frisbee works because it's not those things like it's just something else and that's it made it really cool so i would go back to it regularly that's what i remember until and that was i think there must have been a i'm gonna guess like a 20 i don't know if this is right 10 to 20 year gap from the last time i read it which was a couple months ago now till the time before that and i don't think it lost anything over the years might have gained a couple things maybe i don't know seemed about the same like this is really good Gripping, like I remember. Cool. cool. Well, I first read it. I'll just go next. I read, I because mine's pretty short. I read it for Sanity at the Movies, and I liked it, and I read it as an adult. And so I do not have any kid baggage, besides being somewhat familiar with the Don Bluth movie, although that yeah. was never like a big touchstone for me. So, yeah. I mean, I'll talk more about what I thought about the book, but I don't know that I brought a lot of baggage. I mean, I guess I brought the baggage of mouse stories. I grew up with a lot of mouse stories. Oh, yeah. Mouse and the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary was one of one of my jams mm-hmm. when I was a young lad. Mm-hmm. Mickey, obviously. Although Mickey was kind of at his least visible when I was growing up. Mickey goes into the public domain in a couple of weeks, by the way, boys. <laughs> yeah, really? I'm excited about that. Be thinking about wow. what we want to do with Mickey. Mickey was not one of my touchstones either. Well, I don't think he was for anyone in our generation because Disney had him locked in the old vault. Like the only way to really see Mickey was in Fantasia. Like the shorts were not. No, well, they would always replay so Mickey's Christmas Carol and right. do the Christmas specials. That'd so be the that other was one. like my experience of Mickey growing up. Well, Mickey's Christmas Carol. was actually Carol. pretty warm and sweet. Because you'd have all those old Disney shorts, too, that would always be packaged. You'd have, like, Mickey and Pluto get the the Christmas tree that Alvin and the or huh. yeah, not I Alvin, saw, I saw but uh, I that Chip short. and Dale are. Yeah, yeah, I loved that short as a huh. kid, and we'd watch it every year as part of the package with Mickey's Christmas Carol and a couple other things. Huh. So, it, to me, Mickey always just had a warm Christmas glow around him. Yeah, that was, that, that was pretty much my experience with Mickey. Which I think is an intentional push because I only remember this because we did our Scrooge episode of Sanity at the Movies. That Mickey Mouse, the Mickey's Christmas Carol came out in the '80s. Like it was, it was a let's re- introduce Mickey to the Jake Generation movie. That's what it was intended to do, and that's what it achieved for a lot of did, people yeah. for our generation. But all those old shorts. Like Looney Tunes was just played on Cartoon Network. All the time. You could see Looney Tunes all the time. I think everyone, mostly in our generation, knows what's Opera Doc and Rabbit Season. Like all the kind of references that our kids don't have and won't have mm-hmm. probably. Yeah. But but Looney Tunes, like just the vernacular of it and the jokes and the everything. It's like we just had those. But Disney was weird for such a company that loves making money and loves keeping its products in the zeitgeist. But 
those characters, the Disney, Disney, and yeah, yeah or Disney, those characters, you know, Mickey and Pluto well, what they were also that. doing in the 80s and early 90s was trying to re recreate them. So you got DuckTales, you right. got Tailspin, you've got all these Disney properties where they're like, let's reinvent whole new shows and stories using these characters from the vault. Well, let's create a whole new thing about them. Let's create a whole new mythology around them or a whole new backstory. So Donald and Huey, Louie, and Dewey are now the nephews of Scrooge McDuck. Right. And we've got all this whole DuckTales storyline that was just like, yeah. that's not where these characters came from. But, or even the Goofy movie, which I... Right, and then Goof Troop and all that crap. Never, no, yeah, never got into any of yeah, that Yeah, I mean, stuff. I think, Ben, you in particular fall right in the crack <laughs> of being a little bit old for that and a little bit young for the other stuff, so you just yes. managed to dodge all of it. And, and Jake weird. and I were both a little bit old for things like DuckTales, but yeah. maybe yeah. not so old that we actually could, yeah. couldn't peek in on our to, siblings watching right. them or something. To, Definitely I, too old for like the goof troop stuff. Yeah. You never but saw the goofy movie was too old. You never for saw that. yeah, I never saw that. But, no. but yeah, enough to like peek in on on the huh. DuckTales tailspin. That's a Ch- Ch- Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers. And I would have been interested. I just remember not being allowed to watch DuckTales for whatever reason. I mean DuckTales so, was packaged really? with Yeah. Really? That this is my mem no. Darkwing Duck was the one that I wasn't allowed to watch. I think wasn't there some sort of like it would do some sorcery type stuff in DuckTales? My mom was really sensitive to that kind of thing, I remember. It was the kind of thing that Christian parents would do that. We, we had a similar... That's my memory. Thing. Maybe I'm misremembering, huh. but there are certainly things like that that were just off limits, like Smurfs. Not that I cared. Who wants to watch Smurfs? Not me, but... We weren't allowed to watch Smurfs either. The, 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 some of those things just had, a little bit like Dungeons and Dragons, they just had a yeah. reputation and conservative, uh, sort of yeah. fundy, huh. uh, Christian, whatever you want to say. Yeah, I don't know what else to say about um, that, but things that you wouldn't necessarily think of that were actually pretty innocuous. But. I, I mean, somehow on video, there were some of the shorts that I was familiar with. I can remember Chip and Dale when where they're eating pancakes or something and there's like a avalanche. It's around. It's one of those that's around. I'm sure I'm not describing it well, but there's pancakes and syrup and Donald Duck maybe. Mm-hmm. And it was great. So I, But there were like three or four of those. And then, of course, there were a billion Looney Tunes. And so yeah. Looney Tunes was in my brain. Absolutely. And Disney was that other thing. Well, that's why Space Jam was able to do what it did in the 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Space right? Jam was like, an amazing... Yeah. <laughs> Which I never saw. <laughs> and, like, and, no, and why... It's you know, weird. Part of why Space Jam 2 was a flop is... No, those characters mean nothing to anybody. No. I think no. for our kids, for my kid, I could, I'll just say for my kid, it's going to be exactly the opposite. And it's not because I want it, but it's just because Disney has become ubiquitous enough with Disney Plus, yeah. which we sometimes pay for, depending on what month and what we want to watch. But she, it's like she she has seen the Mickey shorts. She mm-hmm. is a toddler. If we're going to plop her in front of something so mom can get the housework done, there's a good chance she'll watch some Mickey cartoons. And meanwhile, Looney Tunes is like, I guess it's on Max, whatever, but it's just not visible and accessible in, in a way that has made us think to connect it. It's like you want Looney Tunes to emerge on Netflix or something, not that any of us probably has Netflix, but like it, mm-hmm. it needs to re-hit the zeitgeist somehow. If it's gonna- yeah. What you want, actually, is for some somebody to create the Saturday Morning Cartoons channel, that app that you subscribe to that, they're like, all right, Warner Brothers and Disney and yeah. mm. a couple other people, we're going to pay you to syndicate on our one-stop shop app of classic Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah. That's the kind of thing I that mean, you would, want to would, happen, would, right? Like, that service and then, that. yeah, then you pay for it. And a lot of people would. And then you just like go in and you got your Looney Tunes line, you've got your classic Mickey line, you've got your cartoons from that you got your old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and your old Tailspin and Rescue Rangers and DuckTales stuff and whatever else you and your Batman animated series and a bunch of stuff like that that's just you're like mm-hmm. hey I want to exp- I want my kid to have right. a little taste of my own childhood and have some fun and I can feel safe pressing well, it's play not here. just that I mean it is that for sure but also as cultural artifacts, right? Like the forty, the thirties, forties, and fifties cartoons are so high class. I mean, they are well written. Yeah. They, they have or- fully orchestral new scores with each thing. The animation is really <laughs> good. People like Chuck A Jones and Fritz Freeling, and like these right. guys, they're names that I could still pull just because they appeared on so many Looney Tunes, and you you started to notice their styles. Like Chuck Jones did the Grinch, and he has like this very smarmy little style of these angular characters with sardonic smiles and stuff and 
it's just it's well, all yeah, really you get exposed, Tom and Jerry. exposed to all. Yeah, Tom and Jerry is super fun. You yeah, to Tom and Jerry. To, oh, yeah. And it, even now, I think of Tom and Jerry all the time because I we got a cat a couple years ago, and little things that you think are sort of cartoonish, and cats are super cartoonish in real mm-hmm. life. They really are. Like the whole like going to run and scramble in place, mm-hmm. and you know that that little theme that happens a lot in Tom and Jerry. So like my cat does that all the time. It's like we're literally like. Runs in place because her feet are moving too fast on the floor. Well, and cats are the perfect kind of cartoon animals because they uh, they want to have so much dignity. You know, <laughs> right, they, they exactly. They're borderline a feat in the amount of dignity they try to project, but then because they're dumb cats, <sighs> they fail a lot. So they'll, and, they'll and it's run. hilarious. Cat will a cat. My cat will like bumble into something and knock something down and jump a mile and then try to sit and compose yeah, itself do, 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 and do, do, do. pretend like it's got <laughs> dignity and nothing just happened and there's nothing to see here. Yeah, like if and a dog runs hilarious. into the wall, it's like, oh, that's what a dog does. But a cat is like, a cat is trying to d- be something else. <laughs> that's right. A cat's going to run into the wall and then turn around and look at the wall like, what did, how dare you? And mm-hmm. then sit and compose itself in a very Start sort of... licking its paws or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Doing its fingernails. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. I so yeah. All that to say, those cartoons are great, and they deserve to live on. And it's too bad that you've got people like the evil. Well, David the voice Zavlov. acting too. Oh, by yeah. the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, is another thing to come come around. I was watching a clip with with oh shoot, what's his name? Which who? All the Winnie the Pooh, Tigger. Oh, just the guy that did those voices. Yeah. Jim, Jim Jim Cummings. Jim Cummings. Yeah, yeah. With Jim Cummings talking about creating different characters for different spots, and it was just. Really fun interview. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, when you realize that Mel Blanc basically did all the voices of all the Looney Tunes characters. Oh, yeah. You watch an interview. There's an interview with Mel Blanc. Actually, it's pretty funny because he's talking about how he kept showing up to to make a case that he could do voice work mm-hmm. and kept being sent away. And he kept coming back and being sent away and kept coming back and being sent away. And finally, he came back one day and uh, he got the job because the guy he kept coming back to died. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun little gag. That he, <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. And then he started going through his like characters that he was creating on the spot, and they were like, "Oh, we got we could throw this dude at anybody, anything." Yeah, the, super creative guys. Like, there's a Jack Benny clip with Mel Blanc where they're like, <laughs> "We want you to do an English horse." Yes, and he just comes out with this weird, "I can't do it," and then nobody can. It's not Mel Blanc. I think this is the same interview. Yeah, maybe it's like he does a neigh, but then it turns into <laughs> kind of <thing. laughs> right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's just like the perfect like. <laughs> This guy's a genius. Yeah, he's just like, huh, that's cool. I'm going to have to find this interview. Yeah, maybe we'll include it in the show notes. But why are we talking about it? I got mouse, mouse things. Mouse things. <laughs> we, mouse cartoons. Mouse, things. mouse baggage. Mouse baggage. So Jerry is a mouse baggage. Never liked Jerry. Was always rooting for Tom to get that little jerk. <laughs> How about Speedy Gonzalez? Obviously, is okay. taught me so much about <laughs> Mexican culture and Latinx <laughs> culture, as I call it, because I respect it enough to use the proper <laughs> nomenclature. Yeah, no, I mouse stuff. Well, in Red Wall was a big mouse series of novels that I read, and mice were ubiquitous. I've often so pondered was the mouse on Rescue Rangers Gadget. Was that her name? Yeah. Yes. Gadget. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I don't know how mice became the child avatar the little boy hero character like why generations of kids now have had mice like like why that little rodent of all of them has become like you can plug a children's adventure story or a children's comedy story like like the every man of animals is the well, mouse well they're smart as rodents go but they're not as ugly as rats rats have a sinister connotation and mice have an innocent and weak connotation yeah, there's I, a vulnerability and a frailty to yeah. mice, the, sm- the small little guys in a great wide world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess they're underdogs. And you, you can catch them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And any number of boys growing up on a farm or whatever might catch a mouse and mm-hmm. make him his friend or his pet or imagine stories with his mouse buddy or they're um, e- easier um, to put to himself in the, than birds. Yeah. They don't have sexual connotations like rabbits. Not only a. Other thing you can think of would be chipmunks, which are cuter and maybe more cuddly in your mind than a mouse. But yeah, I mean, or dogs or cats, but 
cats are too sinister slash sly. Slash, like cats have their own built-in personality that you can't really overcome. Map you can't map yourself onto a cat's mm-hmm. personality. And a dog can be an everyday <clears throat> man. Dogs are. Yeah, sure. But not as much as mice. Mice is more like a hidden world. Dogs is more like, well, they're in our world. Yeah, that's true. But, but a mouse, you can say the mouse is part of a fantasy world because we don't know what mouse are doing, what the mouse is doing when we don't see him. Yeah, mice are more elastic than that way. They can have, like yeah. Jerry would always go into his hole and then there he'd have like a whole house and a couch that's and right. a TV yeah. and everything. What yeah. actually does go on behind the walls. Right. Yeah. Well, and kids being small like to hide themselves in tight corners and get under the blankets and mm-hmm. pretend like they're in a fort and all that sort of thing. Burrow and, around and... Yeah. And mice are... Mice can just extend that sort of thing. So, okay. I do know. We solved it. Uh, Jake, I don't think we've actually said... So, did I... Uh, I guess I finished my baggage. I like mice stories. I don't know. I grew up with a lot of mice stories. I never read this one until recently, but I liked it. Jake? Yeah, no baggage with Mrs. Frisbee or the rats of Nim or the secret of Nim. Just didn't read this one. Didn't ever watch that movie. Still haven't watched that movie. So this is my first exposure to that. And you can be happy that you missed that sanity at the movies. Cause that movie is a bit of a stinkeroo, unfortunately. Yeah. That was unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, it's always fun to find some animated thing that I haven't seen that I can show my yeah. kids and I be mean, happy maybe about. Maybe but... nah, I don't think so. I don't think it's worth just like a, Burning a, a Friday night movie night. It's out. not. Un, it's really unfortunate. Like as a kid, I was able to enjoy it just fine. But the American was... Tale. That's another bit of a. Yeah, that's like one of the classic mice. Yeah, which close to my heart as a kid growing up. I think yeah. probably the t- the touchstone mm-hmm. mouse story for me. Well, yeah. I saw that one many times as a kid, but what I really watched a lot of was Five Old Goes West, which is a very silly movie, but yeah, I yep. s- certainly did grow up with it. Well, it's more fun. It's, yeah, it's very fun. I mean, that American Tale has so much trauma, <laughs> trauma, angst, pain, and it. it's a great movie, but hard to come back to as a kid or as an adult. Yeah. It's like you don't come back to movies that take that much out of you. Yep. Oh, it goes west has cats being loaded onto a slingshot. <laughs> shot Trigger the, the mouse trap. <laughs> Moron, trigger the mouse trap. It's got cat or wall. He's got Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart playing a character whose main attribute is that he burps. <laughs> Man, I wonder when I'll go back to that. I wonder when I want to. I don't know. Maybe we'll trick ourselves into doing it for Sanity of the Movies at some point. Maybe so and regret that we did. That is a Spielberg Spielberg's so good at family movies and so weirdly out of his element when he does just kids movies. Like he, the guy never could do just a straight up kids movie. Well, speaking of what makes mouse stories work, Spielberg really taps into the the archetypal predator bully. Yes, in cats, <laughs> which cats and mice just have such a. You know, you have dogs and cats. You have cats and mice. I don't know if there are any more sort of archetypal. You may uh, have just put your finger on the thing that has actually catapulted mice to the front ranks of f- fantasy avatars because they do have a built-in antagonist and it's a great antagonist. And, yeah, that's right. And it's, it's such really personality, such commonality. So, like cats are such a thing. Mm-hmm. And cats can be ferocious, thoughtless monsters like the one in the book we're about to talk about or are talking about, or they can be sly, sinister, Hannibal Lecter kind of antagonists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, either way, great. like a cat can do a lot of things but whatever it does you know it's a fearsome foe to have yeah yeah it's like in all these animals in mrs frisbee they don't have much to do with each other but they have one principle which is we're all against the cat we all, we're all against the cat yeah <laughs> and we all help each other against the cat like yeah. so crows and mice might not have much to do with one another but when the cat's around we are we all have each other's back because the cat's just that dangerous, and if we don't all have each other's back, it's united we stand, divided we fall. Yep. The cat will get us all in the end if we don't have each other's back. You just made me think of another great mice cat thing that I grew up with, which is Disney's Cinderella, the Lucifer versus oh yeah, whatever those mice are named, Gus, 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 and, Gus, and yeah. I really liked. We're on the booketing now. Yeah, I really like Stephen Milhauser's Cat and Mouse, Tom and Jerry thing. The yes. first time I read it from the I didn't read that. Dangerous Laughter, I Dangerous think it's laughter. The, yeah. the opening it's, it's, story. 
And it was my, I think it was my first Stephen Milhauser story that I ever read. And I just sat there thinking, what in the world is this? This is a Tom and Jerry sketch. So he just describes basically his Tom <laughs> a Tom and Jerry A whole episode cartoon. of Tom and Jer- Jerry is all he does is describe an episode of Tom and Jerry, but it's amazing. <laughs> in excruciating literary detail. <laughs> it is. <laughs> tapping into the existential angst at the heart of Tom and Jerry. But without making too fine ridiculous. a point of it, it's just like, it's really fun. It ends up being really amazing. Like, I just kept thinking, I, I remember... What am I reading? Am I bored with this? Why can't I stop reading this? And then by the end, just thinking that was awesome. That was it's really, the kind of exercise really you cool. actually wonder why you don't see like somebody, somebody in the New Yorker should have done a pastiche, Cormac McCarthy's Looney Tunes or something. Right, like it's exactly. A, it's an easy formula once you've thought of it, but <laughs> and actually, maybe I'll do Cormac McCarthy's Looney Tunes because that sounds pretty fun. <laughs> that does sound um, pretty fun. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Cormac McCarthy's Yosemite Sam, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or Elmer Fudd. The Acme Company is eternal. Right. Um, <laughs> oh well, goodbye, baggage plane. It's flying away. It's never done that before. It usually, just kind of circles and then we talk. But it's flying away, and some reporters are rushing up to take our picture because they want to know what the big picture kind of thoughts that we have about Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Jake, you are the newest to this book, so we'll start with you. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what kind of story I was in for, and so I did not expect most of the story to be a story within the story. So, I don't know, it was just a fun little journey, a fun little world. I loved really the plausibility of it, the idea that this is so bordering on reality and plausibility that this could almost actually exist in our world almost and that was really cool and really fun i loved how many open ends and loose threads were left what does nim stand for and all kinds of things like that i thought were just cool did they answer that in a sequel or something no it's just that national institute of mental health is probably what it stands for since that actually exists well, I, that is what I guessed, but yeah. th- there was—it doesn't tell you. There was just nothing. True. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's fun. It is fun that he didn't spill it out. Or, well, it does. I don't well, know. Well, you, you, a kid's not going to know that unless no, he, I never did. Right? So no, I never thought of it until just now. Call me an idiot. I only thought of it because I saw it in a blog post or something. I actually did think National Institute of what MH Medical Health, Mental Health, mm-hmm. Mouse Hurt. <laughs> I figured it out. There you go. So it's just that. But yeah, I, a fun little world, world within the world. Yeah, I mean, you can argue that it's better that there weren't any other books, or at least written by him, because it it's kind of fun to leave it open ended. Oh yeah, like I think it's super fun to leave it open ended. I'm, I think I would have been disappointed to learn that there was a sequel. I don't want to know. I mean, I would have as a kid, but that's because I want like this. Part of the reason this book, I think, has a quality that can be really enchanting to a kid is because you can go out from here and just be like, like you can play with this world. Mm -hmm. You can play in this sandbox. You can imagine any number of stories about what kind of civilization would the rats build? Mm -hmm. Would it be something that we've never seen before? How would it develop? What would it be like in 10 years or 20 years or 30 or 50 years? And or a hundred years, like what kinds of things would they do differently? How much would it be like ours? Like, would they end up building their own power plants? And I don't know, just all kinds of like little fun things. If they're going to live in a secluded valley, what would happen if they were discovered at some point? And if I go for a walk in my country friend's backyard and we get lost, could we stumble across something Something like Uh, this? Exactly. Exactly right. And now every time I go walking in the woods as a child, I'm going to be looking for something like this or whatever for as long as it captures or stays in my imagination till I'll move on to something else. But yeah, I just think it's super fun. It's super cool as far as those things go. Um, for it sort of lauded as this book is, I maybe expected it to have a little bit more emotion to it. Like it doesn't quite like, like there's no, like, are you sad that a couple of rats died or whatever? Maybe. But even there, you don't actually know whether your favorite. Lived you don't know. You don't know who died. You don't know who lived. You know, it's a cruel world. You don't. It's not like there's a lot of emotional investment that happens at that point. Like, it's just sort of a, a cruel world. 
and things happen. And so I don't know, maybe it hits different as a kid. Maybe those does or whatever hit harder, but I expected it to have something even there. It was like, it's really sweet that whichever rat that was, if it was Justin or whoever going back to save the other guy and he ends up dying, like that's really sweet, but he's sacrificing himself for somebody we don't know and don't care about actually. For Brutus. You see, so you sort of know Brutus. Brutus is the, one of the ones who's the saved. guard, right? He's the guard yeah. rat. He's like the young punk sort of rat. So maybe it's for Brutus, but we don't actually know who for real. So I don't know. Maybe I'm, I feel like I'm stepping on you here or something. No, like no. That, Brut- but... Brutus gets saved and he's talking oh, yeah, yeah, about yeah, the rat yeah, no, who saved they, yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, he goes back for Brutus. Oh, right. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. Yes, we do know that. You're right. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought, no, yeah, but he ends up dying for the other rat that we right. don't know. Right. And so we get a little bit of heroism, but it's not like, the heroism was in service of Mrs. Frisbee or little Timothy. No, no. Or anything like that, that would really like, if you were designing a story to have a little bit more catharsis or mm-hmm. a little bit more emotional punch, that's how you would design it. So it's interesting mm-hmm. that he chose a different route and he gave like, yeah, we have, like, we don't go back and get the sad story. We don't get actually a whole lot about Mr. Jonathan Frisbee and, in the retelling of the story, we don't get the emo- a lot of emotion about his death. He yeah. died just doing the thing that everybody does, which is, you know, we need the mice to go. We need Jonathan to go and risk putting the sleeping draft in the, yeah. in the cat food. And, well, then he died, got yeah. caught, got eaten. That's too bad. That sucks. Yeah. But we loved him, and so we're going to do stuff for you. But we don't, they don't milk that either. It's just like, yeah. just really interesting, a lot of interesting choices throughout yeah. I thought were. Yeah, no, it is. I think that was one quality as a kid that, that made it interesting for me. It has this, it's more existential than anything. It's like, hey, death is a real part of the world. And all these characters in this story are suppressing their grief because they have to live in a cruel world and it's dangerous and you can't live in the past. That too is a, was kind of a special quality, I thought. Yeah, I mean, I think there's something about living in a post-Joseph Campbell world where the hero's journey is so commodified, and we all know the beats, and we all know what a jo- what I mean when I say Joseph Campbell. Yeah, it's like we know how story these kinds of stories are supposed to work, and that's fine. But you can get sort of stuck there. And what's nice is I don't need this story to do everything that Jake just said. I don't think Jake is saying he needed no. to either. No, I um, thought it was nice that it didn't. It was just sort of like. I'm not in the familiar tracks of a kid's story here. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think I wouldn't want most books to be this way, but I'm glad this one is. I'm glad that I have a lot of other books that do a lot of other things. Like if Watership Down similarly denied me all these kinds of things, but made a larger investment of me like it does, then I wouldn't like it as much. Like I'm glad yeah, that's it, right. it gives mm-hmm. me some more. Sure. But this book as a, as its own thing. Is really and a tiny cool. little thing at that. Yeah, and a small thing. I, I love yeah, the right. uh, the matter of fact existential quality that Ben's describing. Just the Mrs. Frisbee needs to make another decision, and then she's going to think about it, and then she's going to make another decision, and then she's going to move forward, and then she's going to get some history, and then they're going to do a thing, and it worked, I guess. And now it's more about building out the world, and it's more about what? It's nice to, I guess all I'm saying is it's nice to read a book that isn't about like like and so in the movie it's easy to compare it to the movie where they did feel the need to yeah fix quote unquote some of these things so mrs frisbee has like a magical amul- amulet in order to lift the house at the end she has to channel like her inner courage or something, something. like that Ugh. and it's just really refreshing that this book doesn't put you through those paces yeah actually that it is just like about a relatively unimportant person in the grand scheme of even the story and she's got her own little problem and she solves it. And meanwhile, something big and exciting is kind of happening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she's only... She, she's the side story in the in the really interesting story. Right. 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 The real story that the Joseph Campbell story is the story of the rats of Nim and how there's this little mouse that comes to them with a problem. Yeah, and they're going to take some time and effort while they're on their way out to help her. And in turn, she discovers a thing and... They make the escape, and then you have your emotional Justin saves Brutus and dies. Right. And we've spent a lot of time building and investing in Justin up until that point. That's the yeah. whole. And this is sort of just like, oh, this is a side story. Yeah. 
this is the Ansel, This is the story about the people on the outside of this other cool story that we're just going to give you a little window into and let your yeah. imagination run wild with, which is a fun way to approach things. It is, and it makes you, I don't know, the extent to which Mrs. Frisbee is even, it's like there's the whole background of her husband, which makes her grieved. There's this whole interesting group of rats, but at the end of the day, she has her own life to live. Yeah, and that's actually all she cares about. Yeah, she's, she's a not mom. Overly <laughs> she's a mom. By, by needing to get to the, you know. No. She doesn't need to go see what happens. She doesn't no. need to see how the, if the rats succeed. No. She wishes them well. Yeah. She needs to keep her kids away from trying to do that sort of thing because it's dangerous. Like, what yeah. matters is Timothy's alive. The house is safe. It's, yeah. It's, they it's can go a, hang out with the other mice down by the river later or by the stream or creek or whatever it is. It's weird. It's like everyone is kind of alone and life is sad. And you just gotta let your friends go. Bye. Yep. <laughs> it would be but like they're not if, even really friends. Like you're. They are kind of. I feel like they're friends. They feel a friendship towards her, and she feels gratitude toward them. Mm-hmm. But all this happened in one day. Yeah. They're not her. They're not actually friends. It's not. An she had no idea who they were. Yep. She knows that there are rats. That's it. And then she goes to the owl, and the owl's like, "Go talk to the rats." And in one day, she goes and hears. Well, actually, your husband was is a gemeti- genetically modified uh, thing, and <laughs> he died because we had him running around in front of the cat for us every day. Sorry about him, but we'll at least sit, save your kid before we hightail it into the mountains. <laughs> and that all happens within like yeah eight hours. Oh, by the way, there's, yeah, there's yeah. bad. There was a kind of a bad guy, but uh, I think we think he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's such a weird sense of compression it's yeah and that that kind of compression is not something that kids books often do it's like actually here's a whole vast world in a story bye <laughs> it's like what it would be like if lord of the rings was 200 pages of some hobbit like on a farm with his own problem and then like the dark lord was rising and all that stuff was happening <laughs> in the background and what happens is in the middle of all of that Frodo runs over and is like, so Mr. Gandalf, I know about your fireworks, but I wonder if you can like put a fence around my house to keep (laughs) Keep the (laughs) orcs. And and then Gandalf is like, oh yes, but first let me tell you the story of Bilbo Baggins. (laughs) Anyway, here's your fence. (laughs) Goodbye, we're off to the the mines of Moria. You you have the ring that will let us defeat the Dark Lord. Can I have it? Yes, thank you. Goodbye. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's like your window into this big Lord of the Rings story is this sort of like, I need the wizard to help me build the fence. Yeah, right. (laughs) I mean, it's actually, in that sort of metatextual way, it's the kind of thing I always fantasize about. I'm always like, we have so many chosen one stories. What about the story of the guy who's not the chosen one or the chosen one's friend or the, it's like, there's gotta be some other, or the people that stayed behind. There's, there, there's gotta be some good ways to actually do that kind of thing too. I mean, there's a reason why most stories aren't that, but couldn't we have a couple? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I like this one for that reason. Any other big picture thoughts, gentlemen? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Well, that leads us to the Hall of Heroes. Who is this hero of this book, and why, and what do we think about him or her? It's Mrs. Frisbee. Yeah, she's right there in the title. <laughs> it's Mrs. Frisbee. She's the hero. She's, she's the, hero. the hero. She's just a mom that wants to save her sickly little... She's going to run around and risk being eaten by the cat three times and help the crow and go to the rats and just do whatever it takes. Yeah. She's a good hero. She's a good mom. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could make a feminist reading of this book. I'm sure somebody has, but... No, but this is where you say, in all good stories, the men are changed and go off and leave home. And in all good stories around women, the women end up coming home. Yep. And they actually aren't changed that much. It's who they are that drives the story. And she's a mom. That's what drives the story. And her goal is to get home and have home be safe. And that's what happens. And nobody in the that's truly a conservative Christian objects to a woman being strong on behalf of her children or her home, despite what you might think if you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything else to say about... Ben, I think you said something last time about the thoughtfulness of this book and this character. 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. It was just, that's another quality that sets it apart, is you are, this book, for all that it, things happen in one sense at a breakneck pace, and you're introduced to this giant, well, this rat civilization basically in the making, and it's sort of epic tale. Things are also slow. They're as slow as the pace of Mrs. Frisbee's thought. And that was interesting, too. It's just like you're pulled into a world of very deliberate decision-making. Well, I should think about this and this. And then I'll make this decision. And then if that happens, I'll do this. Well, now that he said that, I think this. And you are just like, that also, I, I'm trying to remember what else what you read as a kid, typically, that's kind of like, that was a cool quality to be pulled into. That was like, here's a woman just making decisions, and you get to be part of it. And now O'Brien's able to do that in a way that's not boring. And that quality, it marks his other books, too. And also, by the way, the quality of, uh, there's a really big story, and I'm, and you're just uh, happened into it, Mm -hmm. that sort of quality. And by the way, there's no catharsis. Goodbye. Book is over now. That's kind of O'Brien's thing. But yeah, just a whole deliberate thoughtfulness. It's like Robert C. O'Brien was just a sort of methodical person, and he liked to live inside the brain, like just the mind of his characters, and just let you watch them make decisions. It's the same with the little girl hero of Silver Crown. Is I think it's the same. Yeah, no, it's definitely the same as Z for Zachariah, where you're just in the brain of this young woman, and that's just how it goes. But that's And that's interesting. I don't know... I'm trying to think of what else I've read that does that, adult or kid-wise. That actually makes me think of... Well, that actually makes me think of the Stephen King novel I just read, which is 11, 22, 63 or whatever. Mm, this Kennedy time travel this thing. This Kennedy, Kennedy time travel thing. Only because it's a first-person narrative, and he's just a very real character who thinks his own thoughts and his own pace at his own time, and... Some ways he's ahead of you, and some ways he's not. And mm-hmm. some ways he feels stupid in retrospect for not thinking about this thing and just processes it all at his own speed as he hits up against the weirdness of it all. Yeah. The uncanny of it all. And that's just sort of like a really fun way to read a novel. And part of the, it's yeah. just probably, probably it's just the most recent first person mm-hmm. novel that I've read, but that's sort of. Yeah. There aren't many first-person novels that you read. Mm-hmm. I can't think of many off the top of my head. How mm-hmm. many have we actually done on this show? Invisible Man. Invisible um, Man is one of the big ones. Huck Finn? Huck Finn, sure. Um, yeah. But what's different about those two, the, the quality that Stephen King, I think, has in common with I always forget O'Brien. O'Brien. Mm-hmm. And I only think about this because YouTube's algorithm likes to feed me writing videos. And one that I s- watched recently said, You have to always think in terms of obstacle. What's your character's obstacle? And so people always think big picture about obstacle, like Frodo needs to get the ring to the mountain. But actually, if you want your story to be really compelling, think in terms of many obstacles. Okay, so Frodo has to make it through the Marsh of the Dead. But then what's the obstacle in Frodo's conversation with Gollum right now? What's the obstacle in his emotional relationship with Sam right now? Just the more everything is defined by obstacle, the more suspenseful your book's going to be. It's just one of those pieces of advice. And King's a master at that. Well, yeah, that's the thing about someone like Stephen King is he's just, his stories are so compelling just because there's always something. And it could just be the other teachers being mean yeah. or he's attracted to this girl or whatever. But there's always some question of what's the character going to do and what choices he's going to make. And these are the choices it's that sort of like a make. Russian doll's, a Russian doll of obstacles. Right. Throughout the every Stephen King thing that I've read, and if you compare much, that but, to someone who's uh-huh. not as good as plot, like I, I love him to death, but somebody mm-hmm. like Raymond Chandler, Marlowe kind of wanders around, and there are obstacles in terms of there, there are obstacles. Sure, like he's trying to solve a mystery, and then when he's always finding himself with antagonistic characters who he has to banter with, but you don't quite have the same sense of. Marlo's got to make a choice. What you actually have a sense of is Marlo is just a rock who's going to stay the same and kind of always have his angle on everything. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, a bunch of stuff is going to happen. And I think that's what one of the things that made Jake not like the first Marlo book before he learned to vibe on the wavelength is it actually doesn't feel like there's anything drawing you through it. It feels like your character is just kind of aimlessly wandering through yeah, yeah. this world. Yeah, you really just have to, that's a, even a good way to put it. You just have to like, vibe with it right and if you if you vibe with it if you get on the wavelength then you're just there for the ride and to live in that world and live with that character 
and to just enjoy Chandler's colorful way of painting, then it's super, super fun. But this is a very different way of approaching a story. Yeah, he's actually a fairly passive character in some ways. Yeah. And even a great plot person like, say, J.K. Rowling, I think some of the time, and this isn't a criticism, it's just an observation, I think Harry can be a very passive character. Like he's just sort of hanging out while other things happen. And many great heroes are like that. Frodo's like that to some degree. But you really do start to see the the Russian nesting doll effect that somebody like Stephen King has who whether the character's being passive or active large scale, we're always in their head and they're making active choices yeah. small scale. Yeah. I, yeah. Ke- I keep thinking of sequences through, as you talk about in that book or just like how easy it is to get lost in the... He's like, he's he's got one mission. He, he like, acts, he steps through this portal back to 1960 or 1958, and he's got to get all the way to 1963 to try to stop the JFK assassination. That's his whole goal and his whole thing. And then you get all wrapped up in all the... He takes a job at a high school. You get wrapped up in all these little stories about the guy on the football team who maybe should be an actor and his romance and then the politics of the school stuff. And then that all starts to play into things as he gets down towards the final showdown. And then Time itself, the past itself is standing and putting obstacles in his way. So, but he's got his relationships and he's got his own character and his own internal hangups and his own desires. And now you're going to get the past working. It's all this stuff is happening all at once and it's all been building toward it. And so it's just super fun. Yeah. Huh. That's what Stephen King's good at. And it's too bad that he's so squandered his talent on some stuff that's not as good. But, uh, but it is really similar in. I know it's an odd connection to make, but it is similar in how this book is set up and structured and driven in a very similar way, just much simpler for kids. But Mrs. Frisbee's got her thing. She's got what she's after. She's got what she wants. You have all this other stuff going on. Everybody's sort of got... One of the things that King actually says is when you are in a room with people, everybody wants what they want. Nobody's saying it, and you have you're as much writing about what's not being said as what's being said, Mm -hmm. right? You're more writing about what's not being said, Mm -hmm. and so you're painting with what is being said. What you're actually painting a picture of is everything that's not being said, and I've probably twisted that in some way, shape, or form. But the rats are really just concerned with getting the heck out of there, but they want to do a good turn to Mrs. Jonathan Frisbee on their way out the door. Mm Yep. And they might have left without her ever knowing anything about her husband. <laughs> they really might have. Like, yeah. They might have never gotten around to it. Well, and the great owl, like, doesn't care about her. He's just existing in his own weird existential wizard tree or whatever. <laughs> and it is sort of like he's got his own little bit of integrity where it's like, mm-hmm. I could eat you. I'd like to eat you if the circumstances were fair. But you're a guest. You're a guest. And so. That's always fun. I'm not going to eat you because you're a guest. You came. So I will give you what you seek. Just be careful being out at night. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that owl is a great character. I love the owl. I love the owl. What's the line about him sinking into the tree? Oh, he says, one day day this tree will fall and I will fall with it. (laughs) You know, then he he flies away. You're like, man, that's sad. Yeah, no, the the, the lonely poetry of the (laughs) the mystic owl is pretty great in this book. uh, That's probably my favorite line in the whole book. All right, well, I guess that brings us to the villain's lair. Who is the villain in this book and why, gentlemen? I mean, there's obviously the cat, Uh, whatever his name is. There's the cat, there's Nim. But on the other hand, no one is, there's no bad guys in the book, actually. Not really. Yeah, I mean, there's the traitors, but even they are. They're not, they just have their own idea of what a rabbit rat civilization should be. Right. They're, they're, and they're, it's hard to fault them. Yeah, no, I don't really actually have much sympathy for Nic- Nicodemus's point of view in this book, but I guess we can talk about that when we get to the theme or what theme section or whatever. But yeah, this is so you get, in high school literature, you learn that there's man versus man, <laughs> man versus nature, and man versus himself. I guess this book would this be- This is nature versus itself. Nature versus itself. <laughs> yeah, this is more just like the world's cruel- and stuff happens, yeah. And the mechanisms of your destruction don't necessarily stop because you're a good person or a bad person or anything else. So, 
and all our worlds are sort of nested in other worlds that are beyond our comprehension. And the worlds above us and the worlds below us are all beyond our comprehension. We're all just doing the best that we can to make a life for ourselves. So the farmer and the little boy, they just do what they do. They've got a farm to keep up. They've got a pest problem. They're trying to take... The pests might have rabies. Like They're just trying to take care of themselves and do their job. They don't care or have the ability to even process or begin to process the world of these rats or these mice or anything like that. That's their own responsibility. And their responsibility is to take care of what they've got. And there's nothing even cruel about it. Like the boy is like, I'm going to make this mouse my pet. And he doesn't know or think about maybe she has a family. And the farmer's like, oh, you're scaring it. And they're probably just going to kill it. You need to set it free. He's like, I'm not bothered by this mouse. Like, it's just a field mouse. To get out mm-hmm. in the field, like, all right, fine. You can keep it here for a couple of days. No thought, no understanding of the any consequences for the mouse. It's just a mouse. And everybody lives on that. You've got your researchers who are like really trying to do their cutting edge research and investing in these rats. And then now they're going to try to track them down because, I don't know, they might be dangerous. They might, we got to figure out what happened and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I love that sort of theme. And I wish more science fiction movies were like this or books and some of them are, but the sort of the predatory villain who's entirely beyond us, like they don't, it's not malice. They don't care about us one way or another, actually. They're just, uh, you made me think of that when you talked about the farmer and the boy. Yeah. I really <laughs> like that kind of thing. I'm thinking of the novel and the movie Annihilation about an alien organism that comes to Earth and starts mutating us. And there's no sense of like, it's evil. It's just, There's just a sense of it's other. It's doing its thing. And its thing happens to corrupt and destroy and mutate us. But there's no sort of malevolent presence behind this it's just and i find that to be a very intriguing kind of and this mm-hmm. this has multiple and another thing of nesting russian doll things of of that kind of thing i mean the farmer and the boy if they knew they were wiping out a civilization of advanced intelligent creatures they probably wouldn't do it they yeah they'd be like oh wow that's weird like somebody should figure this out or do something or protect this or probably the government or the scientists should know like they there really isn't malice. Right. The cat is maybe a little bit, he's not malicious. He's just an unthinking brute. He's the closest that you come to a monster kind of a character, but everyone else is just doing their thing. But even so far as we've seen, the only casualties at the <laughs> hands of the cat come when at mealtime, when they're messing with his food. <laughs> right. Right. It's like... <laughs> Okay, the cat's hungry, and there's going to be a mouse or somebody messing with his food, and he's like a dangerous predator. Right. Like, how do you fault the cat with that? Mm -hmm. You really, it's like, you're the one putting yourself in harm's way. You're playing in the cat's food bowl at mealtime. Well, probably the biggest- That's not on the cat. The biggest sort of moment of existential dread in the novel is the fact that in like chapter one or whatever, Mrs. Frisbee's like, oh- whoops, I made a mistake and I deserve to die. Like I almost just walked into the, the, it just so happens that the cat's asleep right now, but Mm -hmm. like I messed up and that's what. And I'm going to die. That's how, Yeah. like it was that simple. Like that's the end. It really gets at that kind of brutal nature red and tooth and claw kind of world that these characters live in. Yep. I think we talked about this some on our other podcast, but I think this, this is one of my, favorite books in terms of striking that balance between anthropomizing the anthropomorphizing the animals just enough and it does some weird things like she wears a jacket or something like does she i think she has like a she's like a cloak or something something. like she has a bag but that also might be mr frisbee's influence a little bit like she's slightly more sophisticated than she taught her to read be otherwise yeah the other thing that i thought while one of you guys was talking was so many children's books make their character ahead of everything, and it's boring. Like, yeah, it's fun to fantasize that you're the hero who's always on top of things, but that's just the go-to formula, especially with sort of post-feminist Disney-type stuff. It's like it's a girl character, and she's always stronger and better and knows what's up. But, man, it's much more relatable for kids, especially if it's Luke Skywalker and he doesn't know what's going on and he's out of his depth and he needs things explained to him and he needs a mentor to... Or he needs to figure things out and have some stroke of luck and 
really suffer to gain whatever wisdom or knowledge is going to get him through to the end of your story, which the reason I took that angle on it just now is one of my kids is obsessed with Gary Paulson books and I caught him rereading Hatchet last night, huh. which I don't know if you ever read that or read Hatchet, read, you. read a few of those books. I remember it was actually, I think read to us or maybe I read it in like fourth or fifth grade and What's Hatchet about? I'm trying to remember whether he's like it. on a plane ride somewhere and he just got a little hatchet for a present or whatever from it, like his dad or I don't know what. <clears throat> and then the pilot has a heart attack. <laughs> and like, I still remember like the heart attack scene and then he goes and crashes in a lake and he gets what he can and he has no idea what he's doing. He has this random hatchet. He doesn't even know what to do with it or how to use it. Mm -hmm. He's got to try to figure out how to make fire. He can't figure out how to do it. And he gets frustrated and throws the stupid hatchet up against a cave wall or whatever and chips it, but it sparks. And if he doesn't throw the stupid hatchet in frustration against the cave wall, he doesn't figure out that he can make a spark and maybe make a little bit of fire and he probably dies. And there are a bunch of little things like that happen. and. I don't know. It's not. My, it was not a favorite book of mine as a kid. No, likewise. But it was memorable. But I have a kid that like really loved it and went back to it and re- has read a bunch of other Gary Paulson books because of it. But it's the same idea. I think that appeal of like he's just a kid in a big wide world, and he's behind every. Like he has no idea how to survive in the wilderness. He's got to figure it out. He's got to have some luck. He's got to, like, he's going to go and eat some berries and then he's going to have horrible diarrhea and figure out those are the bad berries. And there's a bunch of dumb stuff like that. And that's the kind of thing that I actually, it's just so unpleasant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's not appealing. But I think this kid in particular just really latched onto, hey, like, it's a scary world. But if you work and keep fighting, you can fight your way through it and figure it out. And, that's appealing to him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's the same. It's, it's similar to the, the Luke Skywalker storyline. It's different because this kid's on his own and Luke's got a mentor. And most of these types of stories have your mentor figure and other things like that, where he's got to be given helping hands. The helping hand can come from Providence or a stroke of luck or however it's framed in the novel, or it can come from a mentor. Or it can come from any number of other things. Bilbo is going to have the spider fall on his sword and... It's going to be the stroke of luck that he needs to turn a corner. Yeah. And I mean, I think that is oftentimes so much more appealing than like a, I don't know, I just, I, even watching the ones that people like, the ones that my friends like, you know, like a Moana or a Frozen or a Tangled or something, you know, some of the Audis ones that are fondly remembered. I'm just like, these characters start out good and ahead of the eight ball. And then that's where they stay. And where's the drama in that? I mean, yeah. unless you just have so well, you can overwhelming stack the odds, odds against them. Yeah, that's that's so something like John Ala- Wick. Does. Aladdin's going to be one step ahead of the hitman, right. or whatever it is, and one jump ahead of the sword, or whatever. But the odds are always stacked against him so heavily. He's just a homeless. And what he wants, a princess, is so far beyond him that he'd right. never have it. And he's got <laughs> moral failings that he has to overcome. Mm-hmm. He's got to right. learn to be himself. Mm-hmm. Um, stop just being a liar and stop just being a lying street tramp but rat um, street rat street rat i don't like that if only they'd look closer if only they'd look closer you do that movie now it'd be a girl character and the whole message would be they just need to look closer because she's awesome right and that's just it's not as good of a story lay, lay aside all your politics it's just not as compelling of a story. So I love the fact that Mrs. Frisbee is not only behind the eight ball, but she's also stupider than everybody else. <laughs> she's not dumb. She's tenacious. Right. She's got her own kind of folksy wisdom. and But she's not a genetically mutated super mouse. Right. Like Jonathan Frisbee, he would be our hero if he was here. He, uh-huh. he could. Jonathan yeah. would have already solved the problem if he hadn't been eaten by the cat. That's right. And there right. would be no drama and there'd be no story. Right. Like it just would have gotten done. Yep. But she's not. She's got one quality. She, there'd be no need to go to the owl. There'd be no need anything. Jonathan would just be like, my son got sick. He can't move. We got to move. And I think the solution is to put this behind a rock. Can you help me? And right. they'd be like, mm-hmm. yeah, we can help you. And they'd do it. And then it'd be done. That's right. Well, okay. That was a good discussion of the villains of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, which leads us into, oh, the crawlway of secondary characters. 
It's dank in here. Maybe we should put up some stolen electric lights. And... Len, who is your favorite uh, secondary character this time, and why? Oh, I probably like Jonathan the best. Jonathan the husband? Sorry, Jonathan. You mean Jeremy the... I'm sorry, yeah, Jeremy. I like Jeremy the crow. I mean, he's played by Dom DeLuise in the movie, so... Oh, he's got boy. All, all those fond associations. No, it's not that version that I like. It's just that he's fun. He's just like, I'm a crow, dude. <laughs> but also, and I'm kind of dumb, but also... And Mrs. Frisbee is just thinking to herself, this crow is not very bright. And that's fun, too. But John, but Jeremy's still going to be a sweet, like, hey, oh, I can help you. Sure. Yeah, let's go to the owl. Just sort of a can do. Hey, you saved my life. That's cool. I'll help you. There's just something about it that's like everything in the book gets understated and then Jeremy is, just disappears from the book. Right. You're like, what the, where'd that character go? He was a lot of fun. I thought there was going to be some epic climax where Jeremy saves the day, but no. He was just doing his thing. Yeah, it's great. I love how not sentimental it is while also providing a little bit of the light touch that you want from a supporting character. Right. Uh, Jake? I actually think it may be, <laughs> I think maybe for stupid reasons. Not for story reasons, but for crow reasons. I really don't like Jeremy. Just because you don't like crows? No, I crows are just crazy smart in real life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the natural... Uh... Hey, he goes for this whole naturalistic vibe mm-hmm. about each of these animals and their lives and how they would live and approach things. And then you've got this crow who's like, oh, shiny things. And oh, I'm stupid. And oh, I'm going to get eaten by the cat. Oh, well. Like, and it's just like, dude, crows are crazy smart. And so, I don't know. One star. Was, yeah, one star. Absolutely. T- terrible book. I, but, for but its, you, for its, <laughs> it, its crow. Uh, <laughs> Eat crow, Mrs. Frisbee. <laughs> no, I just... Jake gives book the bird. You know, maybe Jeremy is especially stupid. Even so, he's not exactly stupid. He's just fixated. Yeah, okay. So he's autistic, but... Something. You have to believe... I mean, there, not every crow is as smart as every other crow. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to bet Robert C. O'Brien actually saw... My guess is he actually saw on his farm like a crow being sort of what you could call dumb, like putting himself in a vulnerable situation because he wanted something. This book does feel like it's very... I don't know. It's written like, much like E.B. White, it feels like this guy has observed animals and has an yeah, affection for them. Yeah, but that's where... Yeah, that's, that's where it broke where, down with yeah, the That's where it for broke you. down, yeah. It okay. took, took, yeah me out, took me out of it. it. <laughs> it did. It took me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who's so your you favorite guys never observe crows. I've observed a lot of crows. I use a crow sound effect and when I'm editing our audio dramas a lot. Go watch some YouTube videos about how smart crows are and tell me that Jeremy makes sense. I just Jeremy defy does. you to do it. I defy I stand by Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I... The owl's pretty fun. The owl's pretty great. Mm-hmm. The shrew's pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> All the rats are fun in their own way. Mr. Aegis is fun in his way. Mr. Aegis is fun. I like Mr. Aegis. I like Nicodemus. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. It's All the secondary characters just... what's f- well, I guess part of what's fun is that they all feel really secondary. Yeah. yeah. Like, you don't latch on to any of them. So if you think of... And I know it's a, it's a small book. It's a short book. And so... Part of it is it has to be designed that way or else you're going to have to have a longer book. But you can say that Frodo is the main character of The Lord of the Rings, but Sam can be your favorite or right. Gandalf can be your favorite mm-hmm. or Legolas can be your favorite or Aragorn can be your favorite or any number of other side characters can be your favorite character because, and there are lots of, I just picked a epic thousands of pages trilogy, but any number of novels or even kids books, shorter kids books like this, a secondary character can be your favorite. There's really not more than your main character or whatever. And there's not space for that here. Like we don't right. care enough about or have space to care enough about anybody outside of Mrs. Frisbee and her problems. Yes. Mm-hmm. The obvious counterpoint in my mind is Watership Down, where you have similar right. existential drama, but you have a what I think, and there might be the reason the book's so much more popular is you've got a wide cast of lovable rabbits and you've got you yeah know, you can be more of a blackberry man or thump um or whatever they're what are big, their wig. Big, big wig big wig yeah, yeah no big wigs my jam i love big wig big wigs awesome big yeah. wigs yeah. awesome yeah but yeah you get sort of really colorful side characters that develop enough that you mm-hmm. you can latch on to any number of them yeah in in a 
I know you can do a lot more in a movie, but in an hour and a half movie, the same thing can be true. Yeah. You know, right. Where actually Raja or Abu is my favorite since we pulled Aladdin for, I pulled in Aladdin earlier or Gus Gus, Gus, Gus is my favorite since right. we pulled or car, yeah, uh, carpet, <laughs> but, <laughs> give me some skin <laughs> <laughs> rug, man. <laughs> I don't know why the genie would be anybody's, but nope. But like Cinderella's, it's Cinderella, right? But you know, maybe you just really like the mice. Well, Disney's kind of programmed us to say to think the hero should be boring, and the supporting characters are where you get all your flavor, and the villain is where you get your flavor from one of these things, which and is a really smart formula. But yeah, it's not, this book. I think if this book was less special, it might have been more popular. Like you can imagine. He writes another 50 pages. Jeremy comes back to save the day. You make a couple of choices like that, and suddenly it is actually a more accessible book, but maybe not as good of a book. Just one of those things you got to balance as an author. And speaking of balancing, oh, here comes the roadster balancing itself nicely on the road as it goes through the twists and turns of the plot. I think we've already probably covered everything, but any particular twists or turns or things about the plot you guys wanted to highlight. I'm getting blank stares. Ben's shaking his head. Jake's doing like a uh, kind of facial expression. Now he's sort of staring off in space. <laughs> now Ben's smiling. Jake's adjusting his microphone. It, it is Nathan's weird. making it impossible for anybody to have space to talk. Nathan's making I'm just waiting for somebody to jump in. Silence. Something that you try to fill in podcasts. <laughs> 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 sometimes you just say words waiting for someone this book is a one big flashback i mean you could argue that it is actually the jonathan frisbee story and that the other thing is a wraparound if you wanted to you make could, that argument yeah. and i do love i did particularly love that part of the story actually even though it's something that i've seen many many times most recently in guardians of the galaxy part three but i don't know it's a fun version of it it is fun how brutal everything is. It's like when all the mice just get blown away in the air shaft. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Goodbye, <laughs> mice. Yeah. Now you're dead or gone or something. You don't know. You don't know. We'll never know. And the book's not going to circle back around to tell the you. The book doesn't care because it's not about Mrs. Frisbee. Yep. But it's a cool story. And it comes the closest to having some more relatable emotional material or more cathartic emotional material, I'd say. All right, anything else about the plot you guys want to? these guys like to make fun of me for being a podcaster that keeps the words flowing on a podcast an auditory medium <laughs> now we've been punished yeah. <laughs> twice punished <laughs> twice punished <laughs> three times the something all right we're going into the salon of style not like a hair salon like a french salon where great gadsby would be hanging out with edith Plath or something. Um, <laughs> Edith Plath. <laughs> My brain is gone. What do you guys want to say about the style in this book? It's terse, clean, somewhat journalistic, I dare say. Just reporting the facts, sir. Ma'am? Gets the job done, doesn't get in the way. I mean, it's good style. It's, it's, yeah, it's not. It follows the sort of thoughtfulness of the main character and the whole thing we were talking about where you're just describing their thoughts and what they see. Here's this, here's that, here's the decision I'm going to make. Can you imagine if some like horrible Christian had written this book and they'd mm. read a bunch of Lewis and Tolkien and they were like, I'm going to add all these cutesy asides to the kids and I'm going to like jam in these quote unquote colorful metaphors that obscure the point I'm trying to make rather than illuminate Take it. away all that was special and make it an unbearable slog. Yep. That'd be dumb. What's this? The heavenly choir is ushering us into the haven of reflection upon deeper meaning. Life is cruel. You gotta make choices. Sometimes those choices pay off. Sometimes your husband gets eaten by a cat. That's about it. I guess you got the sort of, is this an eco-friendly, is this a green book? It's questioning the development of 
our civilization. Yeah, I suppose it is. Not in an obnoxious way, I don't think. So I suppose it's somewhat Darwinian, perhaps. I mean, he has a whole thing about how millions of years ago rats might have done a thing, but then the monkeys walked out of the forest. So That's, I guess you could perhaps call that Darwinian. Maybe. I don't, know. I don't want to, to make of that. I don't buy Nicodemus's argument. I mean, I guess the fact that they were all going to be gassed to death makes it feel like a compelling argument, but... Why don't you buy it? Because uh, I think you should be able to steal stuff if you really need it and then use it to make cool <laughs> underground, <laughs> <laughs> underground home <laughs> layers or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'm just more of a pragmatist. I, I uh, Given the terms that the book lays down, I'm fine with it. But I just, if I was writing the same story, I would not write down those i would not lay down those the same terms like i i do not like making the pragmatist into the idiot because i think this whole sort of we're going to do a noble social experiment instead of doing what clearly works is generally a really crummy idea politically and sociologically and well you have i don't know i don't know if that's fair because you have his one stab at i'll lay down a moral rule we should not steal they're like, well, actually, I agree with that. If we steal, eventually, we'll self-destruct. Okay, I agree with that, too. It's not like he lays down a moral framework where everything like that makes sense. But in terms of pragmatic consequences of actually continuing to steal tech and being found out because of it, you got something there. Yeah, I suppose that's true. I don't know. They should have just went and got some money and left it on the farmers. There you go. That wouldn't have attracted suspicion. <laughs> 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 How are they going to get the money, Nathan? I guess the sort of progressive idea that we're just going to go into the woods and start our own civilization, Well, man. that's where the book is at its thinnest. And you're like, you don't have any framework for... It, it's like, I don't know, that's where the book goes too far into humanizing the rats because it takes you... You start treading on my Christian toes, man. <laughs> that's right, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you don't have a basis for morality i don't know you're just making you're, you're making stuff up in a way that shows maybe you haven't thought about civilization or morality very much actually in spite of your catholic heritage my dear sir yeah I, 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 that's a little like i just try to ignore that and think yeah it's fine i mean it works according to the rules that he lays down but again i just the rules like if somebody is reading this and they're like some neo-luddite that just like hates tech and mm -hmm. is scared of AI and like all that kind of stuff, this book will just confirm them in that. And I think that's dumb. Like, yeah, I, I generally think if you've got a technology or you've but, got some, but the rats are going to develop Nicodemus's whole scheme is we're not just, there's the morality of it. We're stealing, but we're also keeping ourselves from developing something that's sort of true to us. He's not anti-technology. He wants to develop rat technology. He wants to develop, he wants to give time and space to come up with their own inventions and their own way of doing things and their own, he's already talking about like, he's not telling, he's not talking aloud about this. He doesn't want people to be, to get ahead of themselves. But he's like, we're going to get to the place where we develop our own sources of electricity and create our own, like we're going to get back to all of this stuff here, but we're going to do it our own way in a way that actually makes sense for rats instead of for monkeys. Yeah, and I mean that's fair enough, I suppose. I guess I guess I I just draw I I'm maybe bringing unwanted and unnecessary real world parallels to this. But I'm just sort of like everybody hates the white man's burden, but when you've developed civilization for to a certain point, your job actually is to share it with people and to mm -hmm. help savages you'd be like, "Hey, we guys, we came up with air conditioning. Like your baby doesn't actually have to die of sunstroke." And so the whole kind of idea of we've got a different civilization and it needs to be allowed and there's some great good in it developing in its own way as opposed to drawing on the best of what's already there. In existence. Yeah. I find kind of annoying. I realize he may not even intend there to be much of a, a yeah. real world metaphor there. Well, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. He's so, well. He's kind of poker faced in his. He's in, very poker faced. And it, but the rats are taking like all the best of what they've learned or they're trying to. From Western I mean, They spent all that time in. observing the plows and building them. And he's like, we didn't realize we we're going to have to steal like 10 times as much 
as we ever have in order to get this going, but that's just the price. And so, yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I don't know. I think they should start a little rat circus and travel around and make money, make from, a bunch of money, make yeah. a bunch of money and then found a really cool civilization. <laughs> Surely they could pull a Charlotte's Web and just write some letters or something like that, such that I mean they can write. They can write in like human writing language, so they could communicate with humans and be like, "Hey, we're a bunch of rats. Hey, Farmer Hoggett, you want to make some dough with a rat circus, or you want to gas our extremely advanced civilization?" Yeah, the problem is that Nim would just come and. Yeah, I guess you do have Nim. Yeah, you do have Nim. Then Nim would just kill them all. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, you guys win. It's Yay. perfect. <laughs> Frailty, thy name is Brandon. Any other final thoughts on Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim? Nope. Or as I auto-corrected when I tried to text my wife to order books for our patrons, Mrs. Frisky. Sounds, <laughs> sounds like a very different kind of book. <laughs> Not one that any of us should read. You need to keep those texts to yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just said buy 10 copies or whatever of Mrs. Frisky. That's, that was the whole text. Final thoughts, Ben? Nope. Nope, <laughs> you refuse. I refuse. Categorically, there will be no final there thoughts. There will be no final thoughts. Oh, well, how many cough drops? So I'm looking at about <laughs> one out of 4,000 do you give to Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim? 3,900. 3,900. Always with the not quite perfect scores. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I just think you have to accept that Truth is relative on these podcasts. All right, 4,000. The, yeah, there okay. you go. Good, there. Excellent. When you love this book, if, if you're not going to give Absolutely. it 4,000, who's going to give it 4,000? I don't know. Somebody's got to stick I'll up. give it 4,000. Don't let me pressure you if you really think it's a 39,000. But if you're just like compared to the Bible, <laughs> I have to dock it a couple thousand cough drops. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, everybody has to do, I don't know. Just the philosophy, of, the philosophy of rating things in podcasts is something we've never discussed, and I'm just thinking about it right now for the first time. Yeah. Jake, how many cough drops out of 4,000? 3,500. Mm, what if you compare it to the Mona Lisa, though? Not as good. Maybe 1,200. Yep. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Not even. All right. My goodness, the Mona Lisa? If I'm comparing this to the best Five. that Western civilization Five across the millennia has to offer, I give it 4,000 cough drops, baby. <laughs> I think this is like you've got the Mona Lisa. You've got the pyramids at Giza. You've got um, the hanging gar gardens of Babylon. All the best things of Western All civilization. All the best things from Western <laughs> oh, civilization. which we think of so fondly. Uh, you've got the Great Wall of China, <laughs> one of my favorite Western civilization. <laughs> you've got that temple thing that was in indiana jones in the last crusade that thing's pretty cool i forget what that's called i forget what it's even called in indiana jones i guess it's the canyon of the crescent moon yeah anyway you got all that stuff and you've got the mrs frisbee and the rest of news i think this is a pretty great book and i'll tell you what else is great our patrons they support this podcast jake what would it take for someone to be a patron and what kind of <laughs> magic <laughs> necessarily mean to hit either one of those what kind of things would they get and how could they do it and stuff like that you go to patreon.com forward slash the booking for five dollars a month you get to support us for ten dollars a month you get to get a donor shout out do we have a 25 dollars a month level anymore i don't think so but for fifty dollars a month you get a donor shout out and you get what i think is the coolest reward which is you get to be a part of our book club where we send you all the books that we do on the booking months in advance so you can read along with us. They're personalized copies. They're quality versions. They're the best quality versions that we can find. So your library gets built passively. You just get the books in the mail and you get to read along with us and you get to support the show all at the same time. And you get our super creative, never monotonous donor shout out at the end of every show. All right. Speaking of super creative and never monotonous, 
Um, <laughs> oh, thanks, Nathan. You, you don't have to. <laughs> Let's do donut shout outs. It's unavoidable. <laughs> we all knew it was coming. And now it's here. A little bit like that tractor. <laughs> Uh, let's say what color from the Crayola box of crayons each one of these people is best represented by. Starting, Ben, with the artful Anthony Dodger and bootstrap Betsy. Asparagus. That seems <laughs> correct to me. A little Anthony Cigar Store, Jake. Brick Red. The Immortal Chelsea E. Let's see. Light Golden. Jimmy Beam and Little Brick Annie Oakley. Red. Andrew and Esther the Lovebirds. Tickle Me Pink. <laughs> <laughs> the Keith Master. Brick Red. Jake's like consulting a big list and looking at it and making some very considered decisions. He just sees a lot of Brick Red here. Jane Kitty, you're cold I've enough. I've got She's one also stick with <laughs> and I'm not about to give it up now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Periwinkle. Periwinkle. An excellent color. Actually, one of the dumber colors in a crazy hey. box. Not true. It's a great color. <laughs> wow, really going to bat for Periwinkle. <laughs> I am. I, I defend Periwinkle. Yeah. Maybe I don't know what Periwinkle is. Let me look up. I don't think look you up. know. Periwinkle is my friend. <laughs> Let me look up Periwinkle. <laughs> yeah, no, I know exactly what it is, and I think it sucks. Periwinkle is one of the dumbest colors. It's a great color. I'm a big fan of Periwinkle. Stand by it. It's like choose a lane, Periwinkle. Are you no, blue or are you purple? No, no, no. It's are, perfectly great. No, it's, I really think Periwinkle you know, is Nathan, insipid. Some... Colors aren't black and white. They're called colors, Nathan. Yeah. They're on a range. They're yeah. on a spectrum. Yeah. Periwinkle's on the spectrum. Got it. Uh, <laughs> DJ Sammy G. Brick Red. Benny and Dana Tiberius. Robin's Egg Blue. Also an okay color. Better than Periwinkle, at least. Eric and Catherine from Yon Window Breaks. Brick Red. Lavender's Green, Dylan Dylan. Vivid Tangerine. <laughs> I saw them in concert once. Noah Constrictor. <laughs> Brick Red. Marichip. Laser Lemon. Anthony was cold and hates life, liberty, the pursuit of cheese, and Brick Red. Brick Red. Whoa. <laughs> it literally says here, and Brick hates Brick Red. I bet it does. Jiu-Jitsu Jeffrey, the Texas Ranger. Sea Green. Mm, there you go. Now we're getting into some good colors. Midnight Ninja Ellen. Brick Red. Jay Brack and Ruin. Uh, Rossiana. Rossiana? Ra? Sienna. Oh, Rossiana, sure, of course. Oh. Eric and Kate, the Camp Jeffrey, Teams, you and Mormon Love Bees. Brick Red. Sweet Jameis Sunshine. Outrageous Orange. Cold Steel Cody. Brick Red. John Bombadillo Bomb Diggity and Captain Tennille, his mate. Denim. Saxophone Alex. Brick Red. Ryan, the Terror of Texas, and Eric of the Cream and Crimson, who no longer are stuck in the cold. Please send cheese. Almond. Mm. Ben Solo and Kyla Wren. Brick Red. John the Cosmic King of Chaos. Vivid Violet. Money, 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 man. Banana Mania. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Eric, or sorry, Annie, are you okay? Get your gun. Fuzzy Wuzzy. What is Fuzzy Wuzzy? Is it like a gold brown? No, Fuzzy Wuzzy is like uh, Fuzzy an orange a pink. Bear. I know who he is. I'm <laughs> just wondering what color he is. It's a really cool orange pink kind of thing. Okay. I don't imagine Fuzzy Wuzzy with his hair being that color. Nope. Fuzzy Don't know Wuzzy, what to say. Crayola. Ooh, yeah. I like that a lot. Thor Ragnajash. Brick red. Lady of the Crystal Lake. Manatee. Mysterious Phantom. Brick Red. Jeremy the Dark Hooded Lord of Death and his brooding by Bride, Maya. Plum. Remains of the J. Brick Red. Lamort de Trenton. Ah, uh, Melon. Ah, uh, Melon. Daniel, a man among men, and Jen who strikes again every now and again. Brick Red. And on that very extremely climactic <laughs> <laughs> note, we end our donor shout outs. Frailty, thy name is Brandon. Thank you for supporting the show. We've been doing it consistently for a while now, so, and I think we will continue to do so. We found our groove. Isn't that happy? It's Final just word. Like Stella. What's that? So you're just like Stella. Well, she got it back. Oh, we never had it. We never had it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Beg to differ. We did have a groove. We did, and much like Stella, we got our groove back. Ben, final thoughts? I no. There ain't no thoughts. (laughs) 